All right, everybody. I'm Angeli Calder. I've been working here at Chouinard's for two years now. Graduated from LSU with a degree in, or as a transfer student to LSU, I got a degree in agriculture. So I'm really excited to be here. A lot of my passions include helping people get excited about growing plants. So I'm glad I get to do this through things like this. Uh, this is a hybrid class, so I will be gearing the information towards not only people here, but also a good 13 people online. So I might get some questions popping up here and there. Can we, is this recorded? Can we re look at it when we get home? Absolutely, okay. yes. This is going to be recorded and posted on YouTube. Additionally, I had just done a blueberry pruning video that is available on YouTube as well. I will be playing that at the end of today here in person. Um, but the people on Zoom are going to have to look it up on YouTube because it's not going to play it well over the computer, but I'll play it here for you guys today. And with that being said, let's get started. Anyone in Zoom have any questions, go ahead and pop into the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Uh, you here, just go ahead and ask. It's fine. <laughs> So I'm breaking it down for strategic blueberry planting, the things you should know before you go, what to think about while you're purchasing your plants and what to think about at planting and how to care for it going on. Um, additionally, at the end, I provided some extra resources like our YouTube channel and different ways you guys can get a hold of us because we're here to help you. If you see any issues, we like to hear about it and help figure out what your problems are to see that you are successful with your planting adventures. So started to know before you go what is a blueberry plant uh, most of us probably don't know that they can live to be 45 to 50 years old a lot of them are really large and take a lot of space they love full sun so you're going to have to make sure that that space is available to them as they grow uh, what's really cool about them too is they provide year-round interest even though they, they lose their leaves in the winter their bark is still like it was beautiful red um, there's a lot of options for everyone, even uh, small patio gardeners. Uh, I don't have land myself. I do container gardening on my patio, which makes things like the peach sorbet or this uh, sapphire cascade really nice because they stay very small and they're bred for container growing. So there are several different types grown in the U.S. We will be focusing on the northern high bush species because that's what's grown here in our region in Oregon. Uh, many of them are self-pollinating, but if you buy two or more of different varieties, you'll increase your production and increase your yield. <clears throat> From these high bush species, there are many cultivated varieties, including dwarf sizes, fun flavors, and pink berries. Uh, pink lemonade is one of my favorites. They're, it's a large full-size blueberry, but the berries ripen to a pink and they're extremely sweet and delicious. I love them. What was the name of that? Uh, pink lemonade. We have some of them for sale here. Some of them are bred to be um, evergreen as possible, like these ones here. You can see they still are holding a lot of their leaves. I have one at home that held a lot of its leaves throughout the winter. Well. Yes. Um, what's the average yield you get, like a bowl or what, from a, you know, a from the smaller ones? Uh, we have some mature ones out in our, well, been planted for a few years. Mine are only like a year or so. But I mean, from the size, how much can you expect to get? Uh, quite a bit. So the one we got out of our parking lot last year, we have probably three good sized bowls. And my, my coworker made a good amount of jam to give to everyone here. So off of a tiny bush about this size right here. Uh, what's really cool too is the Perpetua version will bloom multiple times. So it's got a couple different fruiting seasons on the one plant. And are there bushes that you can, um, different varieties that so you can have successive growing as well as additional multiple blooms per year? Um, I think for the smaller um, container stocks, um, half high is kind of what we call them. I think they kind of have the same general late fruiting period, but you can also match them with an early fruiting, like an early blue, full-size blueberry, and that'll 
if they might help pollinate each other. So the these half highs and the full highs should be able to cross pollinate too. So to think about while you're purchasing is timing. An ideal time to plant would be right now to during dormancy to minimize shock and maximize water availability during the summer heat. Blueberries are very sensitive to watering. So when we hit that drought season in our summer, they're gonna need very consistent watering. So it helps if they're already in the ground so they don't have to kind of fight that battle of putting their roots out. They've kind of got some time to work through it before it really hits. Another really great thing is bare root is a great way to ensure top quality. It takes a little less uh, digging because the root sizes are usually a little smaller than let's say this three gallon pot. Uh, and those are available right now outside in our shrub yard. This is an example of what they look like. We do have blue crops. Another important thing is to make sure that you have the space. Like I said, a lot of these blueberries can get very large, some over eight feet. Some will stay small in that two foot range. The main thing about blueberries though, is they need sun to thrive. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the area that you put them is gonna receive adequate light as it grows. Make sure there's no trees next to it that are gonna grow big and eventually start shading it out. Um, maybe you consider using container stock if you struggle with sun, so you could move it around to chase the sun around your yard throughout the year. Another really important thing is pollination. Like I said, they are self-pollinating, but with pollination, it increases yield, it increases fruit production. Um, you're gonna want your cross-pollinating plants within at least within 100 feet of each other so that bees can visit both of them. You're gonna wanna make sure they're flowering at near the same time. I like to tell people to consider planting from three of the different flowering seasons, get an early, get a mid and get a late for that succession type planting so that you can increase your, the whole season that you're able to pick fruit. I also like to consider keeping mason bees for pollinating early season blueberries because it's so usually so cold in our springs around here that not a lot of pollinators are flying, but mason bees are those kind of early emerging. Uh, pollinators. So if you would like to learn more about those, we have uh, information inside as well as our beekeeper on site today. I think they might be getting ready to do a class too, so keep an eye out for that. So choosing a cultivar, this is kind of the more fun part. You want to keep things in your mind like mature size, how big do you need it to get? Would you like it to stay evergreen if it's on your porch? What kind of tastes would you like? And what are you gonna be using it for? Cooking, canning, fresh eating. The handouts I provided you today, these are handouts available at the garden center pretty much at all times. I really like them, not only because it kind of breaks it down how to care for them, but I really like the breakdown of the different varieties in the back. It's hard, you'll find sources online kind of tend to disagree with each other. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have a, a set list here. But I'm going to provide some suggestions here moving forward, talking about mature size. If you're looking for those shorties, consider getting a jelly bean, a midnight cascade, which is one of these, or a peach sorbet. That three to five range is the perpetua and pink icing. So that five to eight feet is kind of your general area. You'll find most of them, which is things like Dukes, Early Blue, Toro. And some of them are pretty gigantic. Things like Legacy in Jersey, you'll find they get quite large. Here's a little example of our end cap out there. So another thing to think about, as I mentioned, is the fruiting flowering times. I would recommend maybe getting a smorgasbord from each season to extend your season. So some of those early season, 
you'll find is the early blue, the Dukes, the Patriots. The Dukes and the Patriots are all, both extremely popular. Mid-season, you'll find Blue Jay, Blue Crap, Chandler, and Toro. Chandlers have huge berry, big crops. And then late season, you'll find Jersey, Elliot, and Pink Lemonade. Uh, a lot of these specialty hack highs are that mid to late season, I do believe. Taste is another important thing. If you like sweet like me, you'll like the pink lemonades or the Dukes. If you're looking for a bold blueberry flavor, you might wanna go with the Spartans or the Blue Rays. Um, and then if you're looking for cooking, you're gonna to wanna to look for a large berry that kind of stays intact as it warms up. So you're gonna be looking at the Patriots, the Jerseys and the Blue Jays. Other fun options. The Raz kind of has a raspberry flavor. The peach sorbet, I haven't got a taste yet, but I'm excited about that. We have them in stock this year. Uh, I'm supposed to taste a little peachy, I believe. <laughs> um, the jelly bean is extremely sweet. I haven't got to taste that one either, but I'm looking forward to it. Fun colors like the pink icing, the pink lemonade, the bountiful blue. And then ones that are great for containers like that midnight cascade, the perpetua. We have a sapphire cascade. They all stay relatively small and will do fine in container. Of course, you're gonna to have to feed and water a little more regularly than you would if they were in the ground. So some other things you might need to know are different tools that are gonna help you be successful. Uh, blueberries really like acidic soil. So you're gonna to wanna to consider amending your native soil or your pots if you're doing pots. Um, to help increase drainage, increase moisture retention during the summer, and acidify your soil. You can do that with the fertilizers we carry. They are acidic leaning and they will slowly acidify your soil as you use it. I would also recommend using the acidic planting soil at the bottom there at planting as a soil amendment and as well as a mulch over the top. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to do all of that. I might also recommend getting some root stimulator, which is the smaller bottle over here. It's also uh, what picture. about that, you mentioned the acid mix, is that not as preferable as the roadie fertilizer? Oh, the little box there, yeah. it's just a different option. So I really like the GB Organics. Down to Earth is also great. Uh, I just wanted to pull it out. It's a little cheaper. I think the smaller box comes with less. I just kind of wanted to pull out a little couple different options. The important part is just to get the acidic fertilizer. <laughs> the root stimulator is really nice, especially for bare root plants, uh, as they are kind of ripped out of there. Their roots are going maybe through a little bit of a shock that helps ease that transplant shock. It's a light fertilizer and it helps them kind of get settled into the soil. We use that in our landscape division for all trees and all shrubs. <clears throat> a fungicide, the copper fungicide is, right now is a great time of year to be hitting that. It's a great for prevention. It gets rid of lichens on your tree. And pruners always necessary. You're going to want to prune your blueberry plant about every year, so it's a good idea to invest in a good set of pruners. And like I said, blueberries are sensitive to watering, so think about how you're going to be irrigating them. Um, are you going to be trucking hand loads of water with watering cans over there? Can your hose reach? Or are you going to be implementing your own irrigation? Do they like lots of water? They do like lots of water. Year round, yeah. like the spring and summer. Yeah, I would say you can worry a little bit about oversaturation in the winter because we just get hit with heavy rain. But during the summer, they're going to want really consistent watering. What does that mean to your consistent? Oh, we're going to break it down a little bit more. But <laughs> yeah, every week, a couple inches at least every week. All right, getting into planting. Tips for site selection. Um, again, fall through spring are the best times of year to be planting. When you hit that summertime, you start dealing with drought and it's just better for the plant to get situated first. 
ensure that it's going to get full sun for its whole life. This is very important for fruit production and the overall health of the plant. Proper spacing is necessary because as soon as you start smushing them together, they're going to be competing against each other, blocking the light from each other. And we have a suggestion here, one to two plants per person as one can produce around 50, 15 pounds. And I think that's peak production. So it's gonna be a few years after planting before you see a number like that. So when you're going to plant, that's when you're gonna to wanna to address your soils needs. You're gonna to wanna to check your pH um, or do some research and see what your native soil pH might be around in your area. It's generally pretty basic in um, open areas. Blueberries really like it acidic, so pretty significantly acidic. We're looking at a pH of 4.5 to 5.5. So really hit it with that acidic planting mix with the acidic flirt fertilizers to help acidify the surrounding soil gradually as well as um, at planting. So you're gonna wanna dig the depths, the depths of the hole no deeper than the size of the pot that it's in. You might even want to consider raising it up a little bit, and that will help any oversaturation issues in the winter. It'll help the water kind of roll off. Um, but you're going to want to dig the hole twice as wide as the root mass. Um, this will help the roots be able to kind of explore into the surrounding area. Uh, when you dig that hole, you take that soil out, you're going to take half of that native soil and then use that planting, that acid planting mix to mix in with that native soil. Our native soil is really great. It's just very high in clay content, which means we kind of need, it needs a little bit of help. The plants need a little help accessing the great nutrients and water that is in there. Um, if you don't want to use the acidic planting mix or you have existing plants already, you can consider amending your soil with an elemental sulfur. Just, again, try to do it slowly. And after your plant is planted, back in with that half native soil, half either soil building conditioner, acid planting mix, you're gonna add a mulch layer above the root zone of about two inches. Most plants, you kinda wanna keep the mulch away from the plant, but with blueberries, you can go ahead and plant right up to the shrub or mulch right up to the shrub. You can use premium compost, this acid planting mix. You can see small farms using things like uh, sawdust around here. That's just a, kind of a cost point. That's not necessary. So if you're just doing backyard gardening, it's worth spending a little extra money to get a good mulch versus using something like just sawdust. Mm -hmm. I think it's mostly just the, um, the weed prevention. It might do a little bit for acidifying, but uh, not much, really. Uh, well, what about homemade mulch? Can we use that too, or is it you something that's pretty nice for you? Or if you're experiencing experience with composting and mulching and you feel confident in compost and mulch, I would go ahead and do it. Um, however, if you're maybe new to it and maybe maybe composting things that you shouldn't necessarily <laughs> sometimes you know you never know sometimes yeah um if you're confident go ahead and do it if not maybe just purchase them. are there any uh, leaves that are better than others like i think that's i heard somewhere like oak leaves are better for if you're using them for mold or something yeah is there, is there any difference in that if you i am I'm sure you can. I'm sure there might be. I'm not entirely sure, I'll be honest, but, but I hesitate away from using plant matter from existing plants like leaves because you never know what you're going to be introducing to your system. They might, there might be some diseases, or bacterial issues from that plant um, that if you put that back into your system, you might be inviting it to kind of attack your blueberry plant. And not exactly on the subject, but would you mind weighing in on where you come from, adding coffee grounds directly to the soil as opposed to putting them through the compost first? I've, I've heard good things from people. Um, but again, I like, personally, I like, and especially because I do container gardening, so there's not a lot of wiggle room for problems because the soil kind of adds an environmental buffer. 
Um, I hesitate away from using my own things like coffee grounds, com my own composts, tree leaf matter for the same reason. You never know what you might kind of be introducing or if you're adding uncomposted organic matter to your soil, you might be inviting like negative bacteria to come in to try to compost it for you if you don't kind of have that good bacteria environment already in place, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so blueberry watering needs, they're very sensitive to watering. So again, consider how you're watering before you plant. Make sure that you're gonna be able to get water there during the drought season. <laughs> Is it worth creating an irrigation system if you can't rely on yourself to remember to water them throughout the summer? Because they get hit with that drought season, they're gonna not be very happy when it comes to fruiting. There's a lot of water that goes into those fruits. So, at planting, you're going to want to water your plant thoroughly to prevent transplant shock. Consider using the root stimulator, which is a concentrate that goes in water that you water in. So I wish that I could give you a rule of thumb for watering, but there just is not. Because different soils in different locations will have different watering needs. My container blueberry at my house is going to need watered a lot more than somebody who has a blueberry planted in their native soil. The native soils hold water much longer than, say, a potting soil will. Amended native soils will drain much better than a purely native soil will. Consider plants, containered plants will always require more frequent watering. It just is what it is. They can't scavenger into the soil around them to look for more water. Um, my biggest tip for you is to not be afraid to get your hands dirty, just to feel the soil. When does that water stop? How far below the soil level? Especially with container plants, just don't be afraid to get in there and feel it. So if they are planted in the ground, about how deep do the roots go? I mean, are they a surface root like a rhodi azalea or they go down deep? I believe they're more of a surface level plant, which is why they are so sensitive to watering things. Okay. That's one other question related, but not directly. Would you use the root, root stimulator when you plant um, any transplant anything? Like when you put anything new on the ground that you're adding? Yes. Yeah. Like is that like you got a new plant? Yeah. You there's in your garden. There's even a breakdown for concentrate in there for house plants. So okay. Yeah. Oh, oops, I got some people in my waiting room. All right. So getting into the care and maintaining of these blueberry plants after you have them planted. Um Keep in mind that what you do to these young blueberries will have a long-term impact on its health. Uh, these are long-term perennial shrubs that might be your friend for 40 years to come. Your plant's life will be much longer and more fruitful with this routine care. So we're gonna go break down and what we would love to see you doing to these guys every year. So I like to talk a little about ensuring pollination. Like I said, they are kind of self-pollinating, but with pollination, they increase yield and productivity. And it's always, always, always worth considering your pollinators when you're doing anything in the garden. So no pollination, no fruit or little fruit in our situation with blueberries. It's especially important for these early season bloomers or cross-pollinating plants in Oregon we have over 300 different native bees, which I like to tell people as often as I can, <laughs> because people only think about maybe bumblebees or honeybees, which aren't even native to our area. So I like to help people promote natural pollination with some pollinator-friendly garden practices. Number one, always being, always use chemicals as directed with your pollinator friends in mind. Always follow the instruction of the bottle and I even have a little handout here if you're interested on different uh, practices and spraying in the garden to help stop issues with your pollinators. 
I like the full side. Easy peasy pollinator practices in the garden. One of the best things you can do is to do nothing at all, especially in the winter time. These leaves, trimmings, branches, um, perennial stems, the long grass all provides habitat for native bees. A lot of them are um, solitary nesting bees that will live in bare soil. So don't beat yourself up if some of your lawn has died and it's just a chunk of bare soil there, there's bees that could be living in there. Another really good thing on the note of soil dwelling bees is to use drip irrigation. This kind of localizes where the water is going to be so it opens up the soil in the surrounding areas for the bees to live. Plant your pollinator plants. Bees will go to where the food is. Uh, native plants for native bees and think diversity. Don't just pick your one favorite plant and plant it everywhere. Bees like to have choices. So I would also like to recommend this book here. It's a very cool. 100 different plants to feed the bees. And I believe it even breaks down the nutritional content of them. So if you're really feeling like getting nerdy about your bees, that's a good, that's a good one. And lastly, first and lastly, always follow the chemical directions on a bottle with your pollinator friends in mind. <laughs> Fertilizing is another very important part of a blueberry's life. They have so much energy to put into growing, into growing these little blueberries, into maintaining new stocks every year. Um, the feeding that you do during the growing season will also help support its health during the dormancy period in the winter when it's not doing any growing. So I'd recommend three major times a year, April, May, and June. This is basically going to kickstart the growing season and the blueberries, as well as help feed it during into the dormancy. Here's a few recommendations for fertilizers I might suggest. The all-purpose fertilizer is just fine. But, excuse me, I might suggest going more blueberry specific, which will slowly acidify the soil. I have two options over here. It's the rhododendron and azalea fertilizer, which works great for blueberries. And then also that blueberry specific, it's got a picture of blueberry on it, but it's the acid mix, which you could use either or for either. The important part is just to get it fed. It'll appreciate you no matter what you do to it, as long as it's got some food. So what is the all-purpose pilot you're using? What's the numbers on it? This is a, I believe it's a 323. Okay. Okay. So watering needs. Blueberries are very sensitive to watering needs the first year of planting as well as every year after the batch. Um, again, the first year kind of helps set it up for the future years to come. So maintaining a good consistency that first year is very important, as well as afterwards to help improve berry set. Consistent watering will aid in health, yields, and sugar content, so more sweet berries. In the ground, I want to say around two inches of water penetration from the soil a week. Uh, always consider different soil types and locations. As I said, native soils are going to hold more water. And if it's a little shaded, you know, part of the day, it's going to evaporate less. Uh, how do you figure out, like, when you've gotten two inches and stuff like that? Uh, like I said, the very best way is to put your hands in there mm -hmm. and feel it. Um, you guys sell those um, soil? Yes, soil. the little probes, yeah. Do you like those? I haven't used them. Like I said, I do a lot of container stock growing, which means everything's thirsty all the time. <laughs> so do you recommend just um, watering at the soil level or is it okay to be like overhead? I would not do overhead watering. Uh, blueberries can tend to struggle with fungal issues. So a good way to mitigate that problem is to not do that overhead watering. Additionally, when you water overhead, and it puts water drops on the leaves. When the sun hits it, it can add like a magnifying glass kind of effect and burn the leaves of your plant. So I always recommend as closest to that root mass as you can get, the better. Um, 
I wanted to include this little graph in here. I thought it was very interesting. This is from an OSU website where it breaks down gallon, gallon per plant per day for sprinkler irrigation as well as drip irrigation throughout the growing period. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about this. There's a lot of numbers in here, but what I really wanted to point out in here is the max demand numbers here. So sprinkler irrigation max demand is 0.88 inches a day. That's a pretty high number when you compare it to drip irrigation, max demand 0.23 inches a day or gallon inches a day. What so does that mean max demand? It's ex the extremely more efficient to do drip irrigation than it is sprinkler irrigation. And that's kind of what I was trying to hit home with this. So even the up sprays, it spreads up the little, what are they called? The small like irrigation sprinkler heads. Yeah, so that will even invite some evaporation and whatnot too. Okay. So the sprinkler kind of has to do a lot with the uh, evaporation part of it, is that what we're saying? Yeah. The drip is just obvious. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like I said, drip comes with many different advantages to it. Fungal uh, prevention, native bees, water, uh, trying to prevent using too much water. Conservation. Thank you, thank you. That's the word I was looking for, water conservation. Uh, it's it's worth it to invest in a drip irrigation as far as I'm concerned, um, especially okay. if you struggle with consistency. You can put it on a timer, forget about it. So <clears throat> supplemental watering is necessary during the drought season. That's another thing you can kind of see here is how the numbers go up as the weather gets warmer. You can see it just gradually increases. Again, consider how you will be watering these plants and how you can trust yourself to remember to think about watering them. <laughs> Can't trust yourself, consider automatic irrigation. So harvest, the fun part about it. Be patient. Berries will change in color. Some will stay pink, like the pink lemonades. The best way to harvest blueberries is to kind of just jostle them off. They'll fall off when they're ready. If they're not falling off, they could use some more time. Uh, it's kind of fun to see. It might be worth looking up on YouTube, the mechanical harvesters they use for blueberries. They literally have just tiny, small finger tines that just lightly jostle the plant to cause them to fall off. Generally, they'll keep for a week and that in the refrigerator. So this is a really important part as far as I'm concerned. Pruning is something that you need to revisit every year. You should stay on top of. Uh, you're gonna wanna do it during dormancy, no later than early March and plan to do it every year. It'll help promote new growth, better yields, butter yields. It helps promote air circulation, which, which helps prevent fungal issues. It helps the sun penetration, which helps increase berry production. You'll find that berries grow best on one-year-old wood with eight to 12 inch branches. So on four-year-old plants, which is about the age of the bare root we have, you'll see after a year about eight to 10 healthy stems. And then on 15 year old plants, you'll see five to 20 that you have to thin down. As you're going into pruning, keep in mind that you can take a total of about 20% of the mass of the plant without causing any negative issues. If you start doing more than that, you might see less yield the next year, but the year after that, it will explode. So it's worth, if, you, if it's been a while since you pruned, it's worth kind of maybe taking a little more and then taking that hit for a year because it'll bounce right back and it'll be happy that you did it. I like this quote. You can say pruning is expensive, but it'll cost you more if it isn't done well. So investing in pruners, investing in gloves, investing your time in it every single year, your plant will thank you with bigger and bigger berries and more fruit production every year. 
It sounds like a lot, but we're gonna break it down. Where to start here? So a good place to start is to cut out dead, damaged, or diseased wood. These are things that are gonna be brown and have no live tissue in it. If you're interested, you can always take your thumb and scrape the skin of the plant back. Behind it, it should be a nice, beautiful, greenish, whitish tissue. But if it's dead, it'll be kind of icky looking. <laughs> you're gonna cut all of that out. You're gonna remove whips at the base, smaller than a pencil size and di diameter. That's, That's a good way. Um, so every year, example. It's a little, printing's a little different for these half high hybrids, but we're going to pretend that this is a full size one here. So every year, these, uh, that 10 to 15 number I kind of said, new growth will pop out the base. Not, not from the center stem, but it'll put, put out new whips kind of at the edge. And that's the new growth of the plant. Um, and you're going to want to kind of thin it out the tiniest ones because you want to kind of promote the bigger ones to take on. Do you ever get suckers that you have to? That's kind of what it is. The the new whips is kind of like a blueberry sucker. So for that, do you kind of want it then? Yeah, that's what we want. That's what we want. The next step would be to remove outlying stems that may be coming way off the plant or rubbing and another big thing is rubbing damage if you've got two giant branches growing towards each other as the wind blows on them you don't want them to rub up against each other causing physical damage you want to pick the biggest one out of the two and remove one to help promote that are, health are these blueberries propagated by grafting on a rootstock or i don't think so i don't believe so i believe they're all bred um and not propagated by by like stem. Um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of the bare root stocks we have. I don't believe any of them are grafted because they they're all cold hardy and cold tolerant of our our area. So they're they're just grown container grown. This one would be container grown. The bare root is grown in field and then kind of uprooted and transported here into buckets. Um, the idea is to create a vase shape as much as possible to open up the center of that plant to promote air circulation and light penetration as best as possible. Ideally, you're going to maintain an equal number of these whips, stems, or canes um, to a one, two, three, four-year-old. So every year, it's going to push out new whips at the bottom. Uh -huh. uh, you're going to want to keep an even number of each year. So you're going to want to keep five of this year's new growth. Next year, you're going to keep five of that new, year, new year's growth and cut back the rest. The next year, you're going to keep five of that new year's growth. Okay. I've got the video. The video kind of really helps. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this this video I just did, I did a young, newly planted bare root plant that I planted last year, as well as a 10 year old plant. So you can kind of see how they grow differently throughout the years and kind of give you an idea. And that's on YouTube? That's on YouTube, yeah. I'll be showing it at the end in person here today, or you can look it up in the future online. So pruning young bushes, they're not going to require as much pruning as an older bush as they're putting off less new growth. Some people opt to remove the fruiting buds on a new plant the first year of planting mm -hmm. to promote root growth versus uh, fruit production. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I just got a question. What keywords should we use to search for pruning? Search the pruning video. I would search Shenard's nursery. And then we have, we're gonna have several different types of pruning on there from orchard pruning to blueberry pruning. Uh, so 
there's a lot of different options in that. It's one of the newer videos, so it should pop up one of the first ones when you search Shenard's Nursery. We have our own page on there, so you can click into the Shenard's Nursery page and it'll have all of our, our videos on there. Um, so young plants, you're not gonna see very many new canes pushing up from the edge or suckers or whips. Um, mine this year, I saw four, I think, four new canes on my young blueberries, while the older one had like 20. Um, so you're gonna wanna leave two to four of the strongest, healthiest whips and move, remove the rest as close to the ground as possible. For the future years, you're gonna to wanna to leave the previously chosen branches and pick two to four of the new year's growth to keep and cut back the rest. After several years, you will have a nice variety of the different year's growth. After about six years, these plants start to, the branches start to lose productivity. So that's kind of the idea of keeping several years so you can kind of phase out the older branches as the new ones come in. we'll talk a little bit more about on pruning mature plants. So with consistent care, you should not have a lot of older cane. Like I said, after six to eight years, they start losing productivity. So the idea is to start thinning these off um, as they age out because the new growth on these will be leggy, leafy, and too thin and too weak to really support berries. They're gonna have less bud set. If you can't remember how old your branches are, or if you've moved to a new area and you have no idea what they've been doing, a good rule of thumb is to remove canes bigger than an inch in diameter. So that's a good indicator that they're past that six to eight year mark. So can I ask a question? Because on a smaller bush, do they get that big? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, oh, sorry, on these ones, on the container stocked ones that stay in that two foot range, mm -hmm. they grow a little differently, which I point out in that video. Okay. Um, they don't necessarily put off that sheer amount of whips straight from the ground. And it's, so it's more about removing that damaged wood, diseased wood and creating a nice shape because it's more about like attractiveness. Yes. Okay. Um, so again, don't be worried about removing these larger inch in diameter bushes. You can take up to 20% of the wood on the tree without seeing any problems. But if you take more than that, it's just gonna be a less of a yield the next year. It's not that big of a deal. You just wait a year and it'll bounce right back. It's not killing the plant. Yeah, you're not killing the plant. You're just ruining maybe a year of harvest, but it'll be worth it in the long run. That means that the year after that, the berries are gonna be bigger and more fruitful, more productive. So other winter care you wanna keep in mind is maintaining your mulching. Um, this helps maintain temperature throughout our cold spells in the winter and the summer, or heat spells in the summer, discourages weeds and increases drainage from our winter rain. Uh, weeding, keep the weeds away from the root mass of the plant consistently. You want them all out of there. Even other types of plants, if you're trying to do companion planting, can be considered a weed. So be careful on how you're doing that. Uh, even even like a lawn can be maybe considered a weed. So just be aware. Saturation is a big problem here in the Willamette Valley in the winter because we're just drenched all winter long. Make sure the plant is not being oversaturated. Consider moving it if you need to, like the floodplain rises um, or mounding it up um, so that the water kind of sheds off. Or if you're a container growing, you can just move the plant. <laughs> Um, consider winter weather protection, which really isn't necessary. These are really cold hardy plants. The only problem you might see is your early fruiting, early flowering, your, your plants, the really early season plants. If we hit a hard frost when getting up close to that um, early spring, spring fruiting, you might ruin the flower buds, which will ruin your harvest. So if we're getting really 
close to that point, maybe you might want to throw a blanket over your plant if we're going to hit an absurdly cold night. <laughs> Hail damage is mostly the only other thing you're going to see other than like deer damage, you know. They can handle our cold for the most part, but there's just a few little ifs, ands, or buts that you might want to kind of keep an eye out. I've got a question. How apart, far apart should the hybrids be? My apple trees are 12, 12 foot centers. So you're gonna wanna plant them plenty far apart. A lot of the, depending on what variety you have, a lot of these plants can get eight to nine feet. So you're gonna wanna do at least eight to nine feet in between them, maybe even add a couple feet to help light penetration. Oh, a big thing, deer damage. We see that a lot around here when deer hit the rut. They just come in and start messing things up with their antlers. So you're gonna wanna not only prune out the damage they do, but try to prevent it from happening again um, next rutting season. Normally it's only during that rut season that it's a problem. All right, pests and diseases. The biggest pests for blueberries is gonna be birds eating your berries every year. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do for that. You can provide physical barriers. I provided two options here, a physical barrier of netting, bird netting, as well as this bright shiny tape that you kind of just hang around and it kind of deters them from wanting to enter the area. Um, so that's, I would say that's gonna be your biggest number one issue is just fighting off the birds. Generally, you don't see a whole lot of issues with blueberries, but if you're seeing issues during the growing season, you can consider using a spinosin spray um, for blueberry attacking insects during the growing season. Uh, don't use systemics. You don't want to be eating the systemics. Spinosin, a lot of them have organic options. Um, you might want to consider prevention, as prevention is always the key. You can prevent a lot of these issues with pruning, mulching, feeding, watering consistently. But also you can use the uh, copper fungicide during the dormant season to help kind of prevent any other issues you might see due to the prolonged wet springs that we see around here consistently. What are some of the um, main attacking insects and do beneficials counteract that at all? Um, like I said, we don't see a whole, I don't think we see a whole lot of insect attacking issues. Um, mostly it's, I want to say botrytis and like fungus rotting things before you can get to it. Um, I don't, I don't remember seeing a whole lot attacking my berries. It's probably going to be more, I don't want to say, I want to say, I want to say slugs, aphids and stuff like that. You might just general bugs you might see in the garden. It's not anything too blueberry specific. And then I wanted to provide in the end this additional resources. Shenards, we're always here for you guys to help you figure things out. You can always come in. YouTube, Shenards Nursery, just search that in the search bar. Give us a call. Um, email us pictures. And on our website, we consistently do blog posts. You can search back on those. Um, we have so much great information from the years of doing this. We really like to provide free education. So, and we like to have that open for you. Additionally, Oregon State University is a really great resource because it's very specific to our area here in Corvallis, which is really nice like that. Um, chart I had, the watering chart, is geared specifically to the native soils here in the Lamp Valley, which is really great. It doesn't get any more specific than that. Um, and then the, those are two articles I would suggest searching. Uh, great watering prescription information, which is where I got that um, chart, is in blueberry irrigation schedule, when, where, and how much. And then growing blueberries in your home art garden is another really great article that I found. Well, thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited. I think this went really well. 
again, I would recommend looking up that video on YouTube, the printing video. I think it really helps kind of lock things in place. So. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them, both online and in person. Can I ask you one more question about the copper fund side? Is that good for a lot? Like, what, what else would you use that for? You can use this on roses. You can use this on your orchard. Does that work for black yeah. Yes. yes. I'm sorry, continue. Um, the one thing about copper fungicide is it's kind of the heavy duty kind of dormant. You want to make sure things are dormant when you're using this. Um, once things start to bud up and turn pink, you kind of want to switch to a different control um, because this might start burning things. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. How did you find it? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, I've got mature trees that I got from a very far there, like 15 year old trees. Um, as far as pruning, I mean, I attend Darren's class you know, on Saturday. It doesn't sound like, you know, there's, I've got a lot of current growth on it. But it sounds like what you're saying is just make sure it's not too wide and it's, it, you don't have branches growing into each other. But as far as the volume, you know, and, and trying to keep it somewhat open. Circulation, nothing than that. Is there, is there any recommendations as far as, you know, if you have too much growth going on? I mean, is it, a good idea? is it a good idea to cut it back or just let it go as long as it satisfies all those other issues you talked about? I would say, as long as you think that they can support the budding that it has on, like if you can picture it holding the large mass of blueberries on there, you can, you can leave it. You might want to consider thinning it down. Like I said, you're just going to be maybe hurting your own yield for a year. But if you're if you can justify that taking that branch is going to open it up to let a little more light penetration in, that light penetration might just allow for your berries to become bigger. Um, the ones that do remain, you know. Well, I was um, wondering because we got a ton of blueberries, but they were all like really small, and that they're legacy bushes. So, I mean, they should. Legacy shouldn't be a yeah. good size. Yeah. Would yeah. that be the reason just because there were so many of them? Absolutely. That yeah. and then the year's production. So if it's on a bigger branch that's been there for six years, they could just be using losing productivity and starting to um, get smaller and weaker, which happens. Thanks. Um, I'd love to play the video for you guys if you're willing to stick around. I'm going to say goodbye to people on the internet. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh -huh.